So before we started filming, you brought that box over. Can you tell us what it is? This box, which is not a cereal box or a Rubik's Cube, is uh, where I keep my scriptures. Um, I have them a very small set just of the four different books. Well, there's a couple of different books inside each, but um, they're all separate like that. And I, I use these on um, my mission, which I served for, for our church. Um, and so I really like to keep these with me nearby all the time because I have all these different colors and markings and notes down the side of my scriptures to help me um, make sense of what's going on and, I don't know, get more out of it. And yeah, and so I like to have these with me if I'm ever talking about God or Jesus Christ and yeah. And so what's mission? What did that look like? What did it entail? Um, so a mission is um, when uh, we get to serve as volunteers for our church for a period of 18 months or two years. Um, it's something that is quite common in our church. I think most of us here have had the opportunity to do that as well. Um, we get called by a, um, our prophet to uh, serve in a particular area. Um, for, for me, I got to serve in Russia and I was there for 18 months and I got to share the message of Jesus Christ with the people of Russia. Oh, that's amazing. So if somebody says to you, what is the, tell us about the faith. What, what is the faith? What would, you, what would you say if somebody was to ask you? Does anyone have any? I think yeah. no. So I guess for me, um, the first thing that I love to talk about is Jesus Christ, because our church is called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he is the centre of all we do. Um, he is the reason that we gather together, and he is the one that we talk about. So for me, um, when somebody asks me what I believe, I tell them I believe in Christ. I believe that um, he lives and that he loves us and that um, he wants us to follow him. Does anyone want to add to that? Yeah, I, I would say Jesus Christ really is the center of our entire faith. I mean, he is, to us, he is an exemplar, a moral teacher, but also the God who we worship. Everything we believe is something that he has taught. When you meet people, what's the first thing they say when you tell them what faith you're part of? What's the kind of number one thing that comes <laughs> up? Uh-oh. That, uh, that very much depends where you are, I suppose. Um, I served a mission for two years in Hong Kong, and uh, the church is relatively known over there. Um, most people, I think they're used to seeing missionaries, um, so most of them would avoid me, because we normally wear a badge that says what the name of the church. Um, and yeah, they usually, they have a rough idea of Christianity, and so they either know that they do or don't want a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's Hong Kong, for example. Did anyone have other experiences, like, or even friends of yours that come up to you? Or, like, is there a number one thing they say, oh, you, you're the guys that do such and such, or... Um, not smoking, not swearing, um, not gambling, um... Yeah, that's uh, a common thing, you know, our church is known for, us members. And um, it all comes from the commandments that we follow. Um, the word of wisdom is what we follow, which says to, you know, um, abstain from alcohol and smoking. So, you know, we believe that and um, we follow that. Well, that's excellent. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the volunteer side of things, that, that commitment to help people? Uh, so within the church, um, none of the the leaders on the local level receive any pay at all. So every member is given the opportunity to what we do, say, serve in a calling, which is kind of like a role within the administrative side of the church to help keep things running and going smoothly. With more volunteer work externally, um, out with, without external to the organisation of the church, the church does a lot of volunteer missionary work. So when it comes to serving a mission for the church, there's what we call a full-time proselyting mission, which is where you spend your time spreading the gospel in foreign places. But there is also the opportunity for what we call a service mission for those people who may not have the physical or uh, emotional or mental capacity to serve a proselyting mission. They're given that opportunity as well. And I know that even in a proselyting mission, we still get a lot of opportunities to do that service. For example, when I was in uh, in the Cook Islands, we spent almost every day we were mowing someone's lawn. Um, but then also when I was in Auckland, we spent a lot of time helping out at homeless shelters. 
going in, sorting out food packages, cooking up food for people that come in off the street. Uh, that's what we were doing through other organizations. If you go a lot more detailed into it, um, for humanitarian aid types of things, the church is pretty well prepared and it is not common for there to be a world disaster that the church isn't one of the first responders to be there at the scene to get mm-hmm. things done to help out whatever's happened. And what's the reason behind that? Why do that? Why have that level of, of we're going to be there? What's the, what's the main reason? I think it goes to kind of the teachings of the church, which is, you know, making sure that you're self-reliant as much as you can so you can look after yourself. But, you know, what did the Saviour do when he was all sorted? He went out and helped other people. And it's not just about helping them spiritually. It's about helping them temporally. Because if someone is sitting there on the side of the road because they haven't eaten for a week and you come up and say, hey, I want to teach you about Jesus Christ, they're not going to care about what you have to say about Jesus Christ. All they care about is getting it for some food. So why would we not help them to get their life to a point where they are in a position where they can come closer to Jesus Christ and feel good about who they are? Because that's the whole point. The whole point of Christianity is to help those around you to be better so that we can all be edified and uplifted together in every aspect of our lives. Thank you. Did anyone want to... Add to that. Yeah, I'm <laughs> um, so in our church we have um, modern day prophets like uh, Moses and Abraham of old, but we also have apostles um, who are called of God, just like Jesus called apostles when he were on when he was on the earth. And um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, his name's Elder David A. Bednar spoke at a conference um, for the press in the United States, and I just came across this. And I just wrote it down because it it really touched me, but it was talking about um, how our faith inspires us to serve. And he quotes, well, he says, um, but our faith does actuate the spiritual responsibility to work, bless and serve. We do not seek blessings only for ourselves. Rather, the blessings we receive enable us to serve other people more efficaciously. We are the Church of Jesus Christ, re-established or restored upon the earth in the latter days in preparation for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do all of these things because, as his disciples, we love him and want to follow his example in our lives. Um, And I think that really stood out to me because um, we do do it. Well, I I try to do a lot of um, good things, even though I make mistakes, um, but I try to help other people. And I think that stems from my love of of Christ and my desire to become like him, um, but also to bring that joy to others. Because as I felt of his peace and his love for me, that is something that's indescribable and irreplaceable in my life. Uh, So, yeah, I really enjoy sharing with others and that's a big motivator for me um, is because of, yeah, that love that I felt. Thank you for sharing. Did anyone want to add to that? You don't have to. (laughs) For me, one other thing that came to mind is um, when we are baptised, we make a covenant with our Heavenly Father. So we make a promise with Him and one of the promises that we make is to bear one another's burdens. And I think service plays a big part in how we bear one another's burdens. We're there to help others when they need help because we've promised Heavenly Father that that's what we're going to do, that we will be there for his children and we will be his hands. When he can't necessarily be there physically, we can. And that's something that I really love, that it helps us feel closer to our God when we are helping others. So can you tell us about the church where we are right now. If people come here, what are they going to see? What should they expect? So at the moment, we're at the the chapel at Kangaroo Point. Outside, we have our our temple. Um, The temple is kind of where we do the more sacred ordinances, similar to uh, the Temple of Solomon back in the Old Testament. Um, And there's a lot more common for activities and Sunday services to be performed here in the chapel. Uh, In the chapel throughout the week, there'll be different classes for young adults, activities for the youth, primary children, which are, you know, the younger ends. But on a normal Sunday service, uh, most common is everyone will meet in the main building, the chapel, and we'll sit down and we'll have different uh, addresses or talks from members of the congregation. But before we do that, we'll sit down and we'll partake of the sacrament. And we'll have the same as Jesus did to his apostles. We'll partake of the bread and water. Um, And we're all given that time to reflect on Jesus Christ and what he's done for us and how we can strive throughout the coming week to be more like that. And then we'll have a couple of different talks from members of the congregation. 
um, perhaps one of the um, local leaders might give us an address as well and then we'll break out into different classes so that we can learn how to apply the knowledge that we have into our lives because what good's all the knowledge in the world if you don't do anything with it so it's kind of that's how a normal Sunday service would look and then every now and then if you're lucky we might have a food after church <laughs> uh, it's everyone's favorite <laughs> So those classes where you say that it's how to implement that faith, how to, what does that entail, that kind of class? Um, so I guess uh, the classes are kind of separated into like groups. So um, one week we might meet as what's called YSA, Young Single Adults. So it's like 18 to 30 year olds, um, people who are kind of in the same life phase. Um, and then other groups will meet, like as women would meet together, and then um, like the youth and the primary will meet together. I guess one of the things that I love about the gospel and the teachings of Christ is that it's applicable to everyone, um, no matter what stage of life that you're in. And so those classes are just quite simply a time to connect in those groups um, and study the gospel in a way that makes sense as a woman or as a young adult or... Um, you know, as a child that's just starting to learn about the fact that God loves them. I think um, what they've already shared is, is fantastic and I, I really love the support that our church provides as a community. Um, we have a lot of um, programs on top of these Sunday classes to help us get involved and stay together and um, support one another, lift one another up, just as Jesus Christ teaches in the New Testament. Um, and. Um, some of those programs are like just tonight, we've, we were all gathered together to um, once a week, we have um, like, I guess you could call it like a scripture study for the young single adults, um, the 18 to 30 year olds. And we do that on Tuesday nights or Wednesday nights or one night in the week. Um, and we get to um, study together some of the words of Jesus Christ um, or the prophets. Um, another program we have um, that I actually get to take part in as well is called Seminary and this is for the youth who are aged um, uh, like probably 14 to 18 if from grades 9 through to grades 12 and it's quite an amazing program um, because every morning, every school morning, um, n not in school holidays but every school morning, um, four days of the week on either Monday through Thursday or Tuesday through Friday, the youth will meet um, before school around 6 a.m. or 6.15 a.m. to study the Word of God together. And I get to, I am lucky enough to have that as one of my um, callings or responsibilities at the moment, where I get to be a teacher for those youth. And um, it's amazing to see how um, these youth go, when they're at school, they're surrounded by um, all these different things that are happening and they're going through all these different trials and troubles uh, and struggles and it's amazing to see that um, as a teacher I get to be with them in the mornings and have this spiritual time where we get to feast on the words of Jesus Christ and help them and nourish them and strengthen them spiritually um, and help them through those those trials that they may be facing. Um, on what else to expect from the church we're very big on family um, we believe family to be the most important unit um, although we have all these extracurricular activities um, that has been said, um, we believe um, the gospel should be taught in the home as well and that church supports the home learning. Um, we believe in having like home lessons, like we have two hour church, it used to be three hours, um, but we're recently pushed for um, this program called Come Follow Me, which is where families get together and learn the gospel together. Um, we also believe in having Family home evening, um, which is where you know you get together as a family and have activities, just like bond with one another, um, love one another, and about the spirit in your home. So, yeah, families. Oh, and on top of that, um, we got our family history programs. Um, we believe the dead family is important too. Um, so we do a lot of work for um, you know ancestors who are deceased. We like to find you know who they are, their graves, and um, we have a family history website where we add all the family history to. Um, everyone's got their own big family tree they build. Um, and that's all important for the temple. Um, yeah, um, one of the ordinances there is um, where you seal your family together for time and all eternity. Did anyone else want to say something about the church? What, what is provided, what is, what is offered? <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
I think we could probably go on for hours. Um, so I think for me, as like my personal experience, um, I was lucky enough to kind of grow up going to church my whole life. Um, and it was something that I definitely took for granted at different points in my life. Um, but looking back now with like my own personal testimony and knowledge of um, the love that the Saviour has for me, I'm so grateful for um, the structure that the church has. Um, I think it's quite incredible um, that we have these resources that we have, but more importantly, the connections that we have. Um, you know, like Anna was saying, for the young people especially, um, growing up in this world's a little bit crazy. Um, and we have this opportunity where we can come together and we can step away from um, the drama and the stress of the world and just join together in the love that the Saviour has for us and the love that we can share with each other. Um, and I think I didn't realise till now and maybe not even fully yet um, the blessing that it is to be surrounded by people who just love God and who want to serve and um, who will go out of their way. Um, I remember growing up in youth we would have like activities where we would go and we would sing songs to old people or we would go feed the homeless or we would, um, you know, if there was like a tsunami or a natural disaster we'd be making like hampers and... Um, yeah, all the cleanup with the recent floods especially, we've been quite involved in that and across Brisbane and New South Wales as well. Um, and I think that they're really incredible opportunities for us to learn what it's like um, to be the Saviour's hands. Um, the Saviour always had time for every single person that he came into contact with and um, I think that that's one of the things that I love that the Gospel um, is able to teach me, is to take that time and to look beyond myself. Um, I think that was a lesson that I've really learnt through the church. Thank you for sharing that. If people come by and, and the, I'm, I'm guessing they notice the statue on top of the... What, what do they say about it and, and, and can you tell us what that statue represents? I, uh, I had a friend, so I grew up in Adelaide and he was not a member of the church. He grew up uh, in a different Christian background. And when I first told him which church I went to, he's like, isn't that, you guys have the building with the gold man at the top, isn't it? <laughs> it's very common that they know the building with the gold man on the top. <laughs> and uh, the, the angel on top of the temples, um, it's on most of the temples throughout the world. Um, it's a representation of the angel Moroni, who we believe was a prophet in the ancient Americas, who came to a young boy called Joseph Smith, um, back in the 1800s, and he was an instrumental um, part or instrumental figure in what we believe to have restored the gospel of Jesus Christ to the earth in our day. Um, we don't worship Moroni, he's just a prophet. We don't worship Moses, we don't worship Noah. We are very grateful for what they've been able to do for us and the knowledge that they've given us, um, but it is just a a symbol of how no matter what goes on in the world, truth will always be heard if there are ears to hear it. Thank you for um, sharing that. Did someone want to add to that? Um, I'm not really mistaken in this. Correct me, guys, if I'm wrong. <laughs> but, um, but I also, so Moroni's holding a trumpet and he's pointing it towards the east. And so um, the second coming of the Saviour Jesus Christ is prophesied that he'll come um, in the east with legions of angels. And so that's um, another reminder of us to be looking forward to that time and to be preparing um, and to be looking towards Christ. So, yeah, that's something else um, on top of um, why, I guess, Moroni is on top of our temples. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Now, you've mentioned the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Can you read a scripture for us or... or, or that kind of, that you really like? Anna kind of mentioned at the start that we have four main books of scripture. We, and in chronological order, we have the Old Testament. We read the Old Testament like most Christians. Yep, the we New have Testament. the New Testament. Uh, we also have two other books that most other religions don't have. Yep. Um, can you hold it? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, we have what we call the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price. Now, the Book of Mormon will stand out to a lot of people. Um, you asked a question earlier, what do most people like say when they hear about us? They say, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I've never heard of it. And then we say, have you heard of the Mormons? And then they say, oh, the Mormons, you're a Mormon, of course. 
course, yes, I know the Mormons. Joseph Smith, Book of Mormon, that's the one. Um, so we, um, I've also been known in, in, in past um, by the name of Mormons because of the Book of Mormon. We prefer to be called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to remember that we are not worshipping Mormon. We, we um, honour and worship Jesus Christ. He's our central figure. Um, but the Book of Mormon is a key central book to our religion. Um, there is so much that could be said about the Book of Mormon. Um, one of my favorite verses that, went, that I wanted to share when you brought that up was um, a scripture in the Book of Mormon um, which talks about Jesus Christ. The Book of Mormon is just very similar to the Bible and, and the, Old, the Old Testament and the New Testament which um, contains the writings of prophets which prophesy and talk about Jesus Christ. And this, in this book, there are other prophets as well that wrote, and, and we have their, their records and their recordings. And in this particular book, Jesus Christ comes and visit the, visits these people on the American continent. And when he comes down, um, the very first thing he says to them is, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified shall come into the world. And behold, I am the light and the life of the world. And I have drunk out of that bitter cup which the Father hath given me, and have glorified the Father in taking upon me the sins of the world, in the which I have suffered the will of the Father in all things from the beginning. And this is a powerful scripture for me, because he boldly, boldly declares that he is Jesus Christ, that he is our Savior, and that um, through him and through his suffering, we can return to Heavenly Father. Um, and I love that he emphasizes that he is the light and the life of the world. And for me, he has been that light in my life. And I'm sure we could all testify of that, that Jesus Christ is a light. He brings us peace and hope and joy. He is our beacon. Um, and so that would probably be my go-to scripture in the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. And, and as you mentioned before, there's a lot going on in the world. So having that, that hope, um, that, that person there is, 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 is very helpful. Did someone else want to? Um... Um, so one of my favorite scriptures um, is in the Bible and it's Proverbs um, chapter three, verse five to six. And it just says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Um, so I think we've talked a lot about that tonight, um, of all the craziness in the world and not knowing where to look. Um, but if we just put our faith and our trust in the Lord, um, he will always direct us and he's always there for us. Um, and he's our loving Heavenly Father. And so um, we are never alone and he'll always be there to help us in our lives, no matter what. Yeah. Thank you for sharing such a positive uh, message. With misconceptions about um, your church, can you clear up some things for us? So what are, what are some of the misconceptions that people have? Um, I feel like one I hear a lot is whether or not we still practice polygamy, like having pl which is having plural wives. Yeah in a marriage um, and no we don't there was a brief period a uh, couple decades um, in the 1800s where our church did practice polygamy um, for reasons we believe it was a commandment of God for that time for that period for that situation and then it ended and it stopped being appropriate the same way the law of Moses was fulfilled and that stopped being the law of Christians um, that commandment of plural marriage had an end and so we don't do that today. There is not a single person I know personally, having lived in this church my entire life, who actually has more than one wife. Um, that's one misconception I hear a lot. Um, another common misconception, which I think we've definitely talked about before, is how people often think that we worship Mormon or we worship Joseph Smith, which we definitely don't. We definitely honor them as prophets, but the person we worship is Jesus Christ. He is the center of all we do. and these writings that we have in the Book of Mormon and from our prophets really just direct us and help us to learn more about Jesus Christ. Kind of going back to tying in another misconception with the scripture. Um, when you said what scripture comes to mind, the first scripture that came to my mind um, is another scripture in the Book of Mormon and it's in Moroni, um, which is the last 
uh, book in the Book of Mormon. So it's actually in the last chapter. And it says, um, if you shall receive these things, it says a little bit more. It says, if you shall receive these things, I would that you should ask God if these things are not true. And if they are true, he will manifest the truth of it by the Holy Ghost unto you. And with us having such a heavy emphasis on missionary work in spreading the knowledge of the gospel, a lot of people think that we're out to recruit people into our church for different reasons. But that's not it. It's very much we go there and we extend invitations. And then I, as I'm sure all of us, when we're on missions, we never turn around and said, you have to do this, you have to do this. It was very much, as it says in that scripture, we're going to say what we know. And then it's up to you to pray and ask Heavenly Father. Um, pray and ask God, is it true? And he's going to tell you. And if he says no, so be it. But for me, he's told me that it is true. So I still rock up each week. <laughs> Are there other misconceptions, especially around missionary work? Do you have people who think it, it means something and that it isn't? And you talked a little bit about what, what people think you're doing when in fact it's invitational. I think um, another one that comes to mind is people think that we just, if we are a missionary, we do it forever. But we don't do it forever. We do it for a maximum of two years. Or if you're an old, uh, oh, I mean, a, uh, Older. a retired uh, citizen, <laughs> they, they can sometimes, depending on the assignment, have that a little bit adjusted. Um, but it's not a full-time thing. It's very much a, we go, we share, because we feel that it's our duty to share what we know with the world. And then after that time, we return home and we move on with our lives. There are a lot of uh, regulations and standards that need to be held as a missionary that some of them don't apply outside of the mission field. Um, and it's just, I think that's a lot, a very confusing one for a lot of people considering, you know, we have so many people out there. And when you're a missionary, it's very much, I can't do this, I can't do that, I'm sorry, I can't do this. Um, but then you come home and you're allowed to do it again. <laughs> and then people just get confused. Also, um, I think also on that as well, with a misconception with missionary work, um, missionaries, like, when we each served our mission, we didn't get paid for anything. <laughs> um, we, we paid to serve a mission. And I think that it's... Probably one of the coolest things um, about a mission is you take young people at what arguably is maybe one of the more selfish points in a person's life. Um, and they get given this opportunity, this invitation um, to not just give up their time, pause their studies, um, pause their social life, all that sort of stuff. Um, but you're also told that, hey, if you do want to do this, you're actually going to have to pay for it and you're not going to get paid for 18 months, two years. Um, and I think that it's one of the coolest things that we each have been able to have our testimonies and our faith in the Saviour so strong that, I don't know, at least for me, that was never um, something that I looked at as a problem. Um, going on my mission, I was happy to give that money and give that time to the Saviour because I knew how much he blessed me already before that as well. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing what, you, what you've shared tonight. We really do appreciate you taking the time to, to kind of talk about your faith.